Have you ever asked the question, who's in charge here? Who is in charge here? Maybe you were at a restaurant and you had a bad waiter experience and you're like, uh, can I speak to your manager? All right? And you're hoping to, whew, don't even get me started about a situation I had at cookout recently. Um, that was bad. Uh, you, ever, you, you call the insurance company, right? And you're like, okay, yeah, I understand what your cue card says, but I have a very logical question that you don't seem to be able to answer. Can I please speak to your supervisor? Who's in charge here? So we understand this concept. When we can get to the person that's in charge, like things generally go the way they're supposed to go. The opposite is also true. We've got this phrase. You can finish the sentence for me. When the cat's away, the mice will play. That means it's, it's, about, it's about to be a hot mess in here, right? The person that's supposed to be in charge is not leading things, and, and the little minions are going to go crazy. Uh, so I had an experience this past week. Um, I'm a Boy Scout leader for Troop 26 here in town, and so I got to go out last week uh, to Cherokee Scout Reservation in Yanceyville, North Carolina. I took 53 of Wilmington's finest young men up there, uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers, Boy Scouts all, and we had a good time. Uh, but there was a moment there at the waterfront. Uh, there's a lake and there's a lot of things you can do there. Uh, and, and they have this thing. Have you seen the blob? I got a picture of one. Uh, this is a blob. You seen these? Okay, this is a big balloon. That's actually the one at, at, uh, at Cherokee. And, and the, the, the principle, it's a physics lesson, really, is what it is. So you put someone on the end of the big pillow. Someone jumps off a platform onto the big pillow on the other end, and it just whoosh, catapults them, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and so it doesn't take long for our boys to realize this simple physics lesson, which is we want to put the smaller kids on the pillow and get the bigger kids to launch them. All right, so that's great. One issue, though, is that at this camp, they have this rule, this rule of thumb, this principle, that they try to keep the weight differential about 25 pounds. In other words, the smaller kid is only about 25 pounds lighter than the bigger kid. You know, safety or something. And so they were like, you know, let's do that. So they were trying, which it's impossible. You know, it's, it's just, it happens so fast. You can't just keep. The, the kids, though, had this even better idea. So we, we have this, this one small scout. Uh, his name is Mac. I think Mac's about 60 pounds. He's also a competitive diver. So he was very athletic, very agile. And they said, it was all their idea, I promise. They said, what if we get two of our full-grown men leaders to jump Mac at the same time? Then what would happen? Well, this happened this one particular night when the head of the aquatics department and the lead lifeguard were not at the waterfront. When the cat's away, the mice will play. So we approached the, the, the kid. He was, he's, I mean, he had a little peach fudge. Might have been 15. And uh, we were like, hey, uh, you think it would be okay if two of us leaders, I mean, I'm not, I may or may not have been involved. There, was, there were two leaders. <laughs> if if they, we got this kid, can we launch him? And I, no, no lie, this, this kid's brains, uh, the wheels are turning, and he's like, I know I should say no. Like, I I know that the right answer here is no, but he said, these are the words that came out of his mouth. I kind of want to see that. <laughs> and then he says, I might lose my job over this, but okay. <laughs> so we, they get on there. <laughs> Matt gets ready. Uh, there's a coordination. We're gonna pra we did the practice, you know, one, two, three. Is it on three? Is it after three? On three? Okay. And then... Boom, okay, so after the one, two, three, jump, the waterfront goes quiet, okay, because the, the word had spread. There's probably 100 boys out there that, like, this is about to go down. And so it got quiet, and everybody's looking, and we're flying through there. I remember a distinct silence, and then I remember, like, this noise, and then you just, when you jump, you get, you get swallowed by the pillow. So there's, like, a five-foot ramp of pillow, but then I just see Mac. <laughs> and he's up there, and he's like, woo! I mean, the crowd goes wild. The boys are screaming. Mac does a, a, a re-entry that should have earned him a gold medal. And the lifeguard goes, whew, let's not do that again. <laughs> uh, who's in charge here? Who is in charge here? That's our question of today. Who's in charge here? Uh, we're in this teaching series through the book of Romans. And our goal is to get through the entire book of Romans in about seven weeks. Uh, last week, we got all the way up to chapter 8. Actually, uh, while I was away at scout camp, uh, Patrick came in, did a great job teaching of chapter 6 and 7. And he, he, he entered into 8 just a little bit. And so it helped me out a little bit there. Because, you know, as we're getting in through this series, let me give you some backup. If, you, if you're just joining us for the first time today or you haven't caught up, uh, first of all, please catch up on the podcast. We're on most podcasts players, just look at Venture Church, or at our website, jointheventure.com slash podcast. Uh, so there's, I guess, three weeks before now. 
And, and there's a lot that we could recap. It's good stuff. But Paul, who is the author of this book, he's writing this letter to a group of Christians who live in Rome. He does us a huge favor. He writes a bit of a recap for us in chapter 8, starting at verse 1. And so um, if you've got a Bible, flip over to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be in 8. We're going to get through uh, the entire chapter of 8 today. If you don't have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open it up on your phone. There's a great Bible app. Or grab one of our paper Bibles before uh, you leave today. We want everybody to have a good readable version of the Bible, and they're free. Please take one with you uh, or grab one now. So chapter 8, we're going to pick up the Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 1. And this is kind of the summary up to this point. Anytime you see in the Bible, particularly in Paul's writing, the word therefore, I mean, therefore is a word of summary. Because of all this, therefore, this. So this is a, a kind of summary thing. This is just a summary. Therefore, there is no, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's a great sentence. All right, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So much packed into those two sentences, the, the, the whole history of the first seven chapters. But that's where we're going to jump in today. In short, because of Jesus, we can have spiritual life. That, that's the summary up to this point. And the word for that is grace. We don't earn it. We can't earn it. It's a gift. So as we pick up today, Paul's going to turn a corner. And basically he's going to say, look, Jesus has done all the work. But there's still some very deliberate decision making for each of us to do now. And essentially he's going to ask this question that we started out with. Who's in charge here? Who's going to rule your life? And so we're going to jump in now starting in verse 5, Romans 8. Verse 5, and he's going to kind of lay out the two fields. These are the two options of who could be in charge here. Starting at verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. So just to make sure we don't miss it, there's, there's kind of two contingencies vying for our attention. It is the flesh and the Spirit so we have two options. We can let our flesh be in charge, or we can let God's spirit be in charge of our life. The spirit versus the flesh. Who's in charge here? So let's keep going. Verse 6. So the mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. But you, however, are in the realm, are not in the realm of the flesh. You are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God is, lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of God, they do not belong to Christ. Now, I don't want to belabor this side of the point, but I want to make sure it's very clear because Paul takes the effort to make it very clear that if we're governed by the flesh, in other words, we're going to let our carnal desires, this this physical, brick and mortar, fresh, flesh and blown, bone part of us, if we're going to let that rule us, there are going to be some side effects, and those side effects are going to cause our spiritual life to go sideways. And so we're going to, I got kind of a, a list here, a bulleted list. You can write them down or circle them in your Bible, underline them. Verse 6 says that a life governed by the flesh is first death. And we're talking spiritual death, like a, a separation from God. Verse 7 says that the life governed by the flesh is hostility towards God. Also in verse 7, we do not and we cannot submit to God. Verse 8, we cannot please God. Verse 9, we not, do not belong to him. This is the life governed by the flesh. And I don't know about you, but this list is, is pretty accurate. Let's just leave that up there for a minute. Like I believe myself, as you probably do, believe yourself to be a pretty intelligent person, right? I, I think I can make good choices. I think I've got the ability to be a quote unquote good person, but ultimately when I allow myself to be governed by my flesh, I'm not concerned with the things of God. I'm not interested in what he wants for my life. I want what I want. And that can lead me to some dark places, and it has. See, if I'm focused on building my own little empire, my flesh, growing my brand, making my name great, or, or making myself feel good, I'm totally missing out on this amazing plan that God has for my life, because I think I know better. I'm not able to do what he wants me to do, which are these things. Put him first. Honor him with my choices. 
bring him joy with my actions. This is a huge one. Love other people sacrificially. It helped build them up. I guess a big part of what God wants us to do in this world. And here's the thing. I know good people. I know lots of really good people who are missing out on God's plan for their life. They're not bad people. They're good people. They're missing out. But look at the list. The things, the things that they're allowing to happen in their life is that they're hostile to God. They're not concerned with the things of God. The very first thing, they're spiritually dead. You know? And it's not that they're bad people. They're good people. Yet it still leads to spiritual death because there's a separation from God because we're not allowing him to lead us. But here's the thing. We're not always good people, are we? Like when we're focused on being bad, it, <laughs> right? It goes quick. And a life governed by the flesh when not, even, when not even checked can lead to some really bad things. I mean, it leads to addiction. It leads to uh, abuse. It leads to assault. It leads to hate and violence. It leads to taking advantage of other people. This is probably the worst thing. Because when I'm living for myself, I, I could care less about somebody else. As long as it improves upon what I got going on. It leads to crime. It leads to murder. It leads to all the things we have laws against and about. Because a life... Governed by the flesh is death. That's where it heads. Verse 9 gave us an encouragement. I want to look at that thing again. Verse 9 says, but you, however, he's talking to a group of Christians in Rome. He's talking to us if you claim Christ today. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh. You're in the realm of the spirit if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And so that's, that's column A. Like this is what happens if we're living in the flesh. But in starting in verse 10, he's going to give us kind of column B. In this column, we get what happens if we live in the Spirit. So let's look at verse 10. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. We're talking about the gears of the gospel through this series. And we're calling the series the gears of the gospel because the book of Romans reads a bit, a bit like an instruction manual for Christianity. Like how, how to live a life that pleases God and, and how to live for Jesus and that kind of stuff. And, and this is the mechanics of how this relationship works. In verse 10, we get some deep stuff to chew on. Leave, leave that up there because check this out. And I want you to follow me on this. If we're governed by the flesh, the result will eventually be death. Eventually, it'll be spiritual death, separation from God. But when the Spirit takes over, the result is life. So we learned last week that when you choose Christ, you die to sin. And there's this beautiful picture of that in Christian baptism. You go down into the watery grave of baptism. It's an imagery of what happens with your old self. And you're raised to walk in newness of life. That is literally what it says in Romans chapter 6. And so from that place, we can, uh, we can come to a place where we can be made right with God. So here, here's, the, here's the, it's a little bit deep, but maybe, but stick with me. Okay, there's kind of three, three steps here. Step one, we talked about in week one, we learned that wickedness brings God's wrath. Wickedness brings God's wrath, but righteousness brings God joy. So what does wickedness bring? God's wrath. And righteousness brings God what? joy. That's a, that's a big thing to understand. That was week one. Week two, we learned about the doorway of faith, that through faith, we have access to God's grace, his forgiveness. So faith is a big deal. And we learned that when we put our faith in Jesus, we get credit for being righteous. Faith is credited to us as righteous. Like when you get a credit on your account, it can happen just because someone was nice. Just drop some money in your bank. That's nice. Faith is credited to, to us as righteousness, not because we earned it, not because we can ever pay it off, but because God just says, I'm giving you credit, and your credit is righteousness. So what is it that brings God joy? Righteousness. Faith gives us righteousness. And so in a really cool way, God is... He sees our brokenness in our sin, in our mess up, in our screw ups. We've dishonored God. We deserve his wrath. But he's made us a way to bring him joy. Through our faith, we are, we are given his righteousness. It's not something we earn. But we get to wear it like a letter jacket. Walking down the hall, big man, big lady on campus. Because we are covered in his grace because we put faith in him. Are you with me? So, so this whole chapter can get kind of confusing. But if you can just follow that and be like, oh, okay, this is a gift. Check out our last part. 
if we put our faith in Jesus and we are obedient to him, so we've got the righteousness thing. This is what's really cool. God moves into our lives through his spirit. His Holy Spirit moves in. We're going to talk about that. The clearest time that we see in Scripture when the Holy Spirit moves into uh, a believer's life, we can see it in Acts chapter 2. And this is when Peter is giving this big sermon and he says, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're given this moment where we can die to our old self, we can rise and walk into this life. There are other times in Scripture where the Holy Spirit comes in people, the apostles lay their hands on people. Sometimes the Spirit just comes into people's life. But we're guaranteed, like if in faith, if we choose Jesus and we're baptized in Him, this is a moment we can know, like this moment. But whatever the case, the Spirit of God moves into our life. And so now we look back at verse 10 again. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life. Because of righteousness. God's Holy Spirit gives us life. And it is a lopsided deal. I mean, what did, what did we do to earn that? You can't. That's the gift. Which leads to the question, who's in charge here? God comes in. He implants a part of himself into our life to guide us, to teach us, to help us. But will we let him lead? Who's in charge here? Uh, I want to step aside, and I want, I want to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we had a great teaching series through uh, the, we called it Walk the Walk last year, and I did a week specifically focused just on who is the Holy Spirit. So I recommend you go look at that. It's probably like last July on our podcast. Um, but I want to give you kind of a Cliff's Note version of that because there's a couple things you need to know. First of all is this. The Holy Spirit is God's manifestation in the, in the spiritual realm. The Holy Spirit is, is God's spirit. So the Holy Spirit is God. He is God. It's just his spirit version. Just like Jesus is his physical manifestation. This is God. The Holy Spirit is how God interacts with creation and humanity. We see the Holy Spirit in the very first verses of the Bible when, when the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters of the deep before God created all things. The Spirit was there. And we see him all throughout the story. Uh, this is how God interacts with creation and with mankind. His spirit moves among us. We also learned this. The Holy Spirit, I'm going to say it this way. The Holy Spirit is a person. Not a human, but, but a personality. So I just like to kind of give this little warning or this little, I don't know if it's a warning so much as a, an instruction or a thought. Let's not make the mistake of calling the Holy Spirit an it. Uh, this pronoun here is not about gender. It's about personality. Some people have referred to the Holy Spirit as, a, as a, a woman, a female. It's fine. I don't think God's gender is something we're concerned with. I think what we're concerned is saying this is, a, this is an entity, a being, an intelligent, a very powerful intelligent, let's say supremely powerful and intelligent being. So he is a person, and as such, he, he has, if we are created in the image of God, then the Holy Spirit gets us. Not just an, a, a nameless force something that we can't interact with, but something that it truly interacts with us. Uh, we see him moving throughout the entire Bible, through the Old Testament, through the New Testament. And so the Holy Spirit is involved in all these things, but we see him most clearly coming into the lives of people. Uh, first of all, in Acts chapter 1, which is in the New Testament, Jesus has lived. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the stories of Jesus' life. But then when we get to Acts chapter 1, Jesus is about to ascend back into heaven. He's resurrected from the dead. But before he goes, he tells his followers, listen, I am going to send you a helper. It's God's Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, we see the story that I just shared, that, that these people accepted Christ that day, and the Holy Spirit moved in. 3,000 people received the Holy Spirit in their lives that day. Uh, the book of Acts is full of the Holy Spirit, and it's been called the Acts of the Apostles, the book of Acts. But I, I've heard, and I rightly believe it's true, that it, it could be called or should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because what we see is these men and women doing amazing things, miraculous things, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And they always give God's Spirit the, the credit. In Galatians chapter 5, we see that the Spirit moves into our life. We receive what's called the fruit of the Spirit. And it actually modifies our character. That the fruit of God's Spirit in our life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And in other scripture, we see other attributes that God builds in us through His Spirit. And so who's in charge here? Well, who seems more capable, my flesh or God's all-powerful spirit? Who do we want to lead this vessel? And this is really the wrestling match that happens once we accept Jesus. Who am I going to allow to lead me? I can tell you, at 37 years old, I have not got it all figured out. 
Ask my wife, she'll tell you that I think I do. <laughs> but I do not. I don't know the secrets of the universe. I don't even know where to find my soul. I couldn't tell you where it is. I don't know if it's in a safety deposit box somewhere. I don't know if it's actually in here. I don't know if it's like some sort of wireless connection somewhere in the cloud. I don't know. I don't know that. How can I begin to lead my own life? Even though I try to be a good person, even though I try to make good choices, God says, let me move in, let me move in, let me, let me govern your mind. I can tell you the flip side, that when I've focused on and allowed the spirit to govern my mind, my thoughts, my choices, my actions, it's night and day. I'm a better man, I'm a better father, I'm a better husband, I'm a better citizen, I'm a better human being. Because God's spirit brings life because of righteousness. Let's look back at our text, verse 11. Romans 8, verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, time out. Okay, I just got, this is the spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, okay? This is not just like one of God's extra spirits. Like he's just got floating around. It's like the same one, the same one that rose Jesus from the dead. Okay, let me go back to verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh. <laughs> what has our flesh done for us? The older I get, the more I realize it's letting me down. <laughs> I did the blob two days in a row. Third day, I was like, can't do it. <laughs> I can hardly get out of bed today. And we're just talking about our bodies, but I'm talking about the, the, the flesh governing the mind we have an obligation but it is not to the flesh to live according to it for if you live according to the flesh you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body you will live who's in charge here who's running this show being made right with God is something that happens when we accept Jesus. I want to go through a couple of uh, theological words. Um, I don't believe theology saves you. I think it helps you have good conversations. I think that it is often something that divides us because we think we understand all the words. But sometimes theology is helpful because there's some really good words. Here's a good one. This word is called justification. Justification is being made right with God. That's what we just talked about. I love this sentence that I heard from a guy one time. He said, justification is instant and it happens in the mind of God. So uh, you might have a friend that's like, they accepted Jesus, and you're like, mm, I'm not so sure. Well, it's not, it doesn't matter what's in your mind. <laughs> justification happens in the mind of God. He knows the yes or the no. He knows what was in the heart of the person that happened. That's justification. It's the moment of be, being made righteous in, the, righteous in the, 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 uh, the sight of God. Odds are good you may still commit some of the worst sins of your life after that moment. It's happened to many people. But as long as we're continuing to seek God, he says, I'm not going to leave you. And there's another word. The second word is sanctification. Sanctification is the process of learning how to live a holy life. See, in a moment, God says, you're good with me. You're in. But there's a process. And for the rest of your life, I need you to walk through that process. Sanctification is about becoming holy. Becoming, so, so there's this idea that like uh, in Christianity we use this phrase, got saved. I got saved. And it's like we got this like get out of hell free card and we get to <laughs> flash it around everywhere and then do whatever I want to do. Chapter 6 talks about that. Should we go on sinning so the grace may increase? Mm, by no means. <laughs> may it never be. Because after we get pulled out of the muck and mire of our own flesh... God says, I want you to start walking with me day by day by day by day by day by day. Because the more you do that, the more you know me, the more the sanctification process takes place, the more you'll understand my love, the more joy you'll receive from being alive. Even people living in terrible persecution and hardship can step on the other side of that and go, yeah, wow, but it's still worth it. And I wish I could stand here and have a good enough commercial for anybody who's skeptical of that, that you'd be like, I'm in, but i got to be honest. It's about living through it or, or by walking through it with someone else because we continually see God's goodness, his provision, his faithfulness. So if you've already accepted Jesus, 
This is the road you're on now. We slip, we slide, we stub our toes, we smash our faces. Sometimes we turn around and go the other way. But God's still standing ahead going, come on, come on, come on. That's sanctification. And if you've never accepted Jesus, you're in a place where you're still wondering about this, I want you to know this. You can do that today. Call in the name of Jesus, say, I, want, I believe the stuff I've been hearing. We can have a baptism right here in the pool across the hall. Snap, in the mind of God, justification has happened. The Holy Spirit moves in and sanctification begins. And we can all be on the same page. God is good. His grace is awesome. Not only that, though, the Holy Spirit moves in. He starts to help us. The Holy Spirit becomes this, like, partner in life for us. And as we keep on reading through this, we're not going to read every single verse just for time's sake. I really want to, I want to encourage you to read all of chapter 8. Uh, I gave the challenge to try to read all of Romans every week this seven weeks. i got to be honest, I've done two out of three of the, the weeks in between sermons. I'm halfway through this week. I didn't quite make it. But, man, the more times you read it, the more it starts to get in your head. Or just try to read it one time through total. At least read chapter 8 this week. Because we learn what the Holy Spirit does in our life. In verse 14, we learn this awesome thing. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Any parents in the room? Do you love your children? Yeah. W would you step in front of a vehicle to save your child's life? Absolutely. Without hesitation. If you haven't had kids yet, especially if you are a kid, you, you might, like, theoretically think you would do that. But I'm telling you, you will. We Listen to this. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. That's a term of endearment in, in their language that we would, we would say, Daddy or Papa. It's, a, it's an intimate term of endearment for your father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. I, I don't know where my soul is, but wherever it is, the Holy Spirit, I, I have always envisioned it like, like a roommate situation. I don't know if we got bunk beds. I don't know who gets the top bunk. I don't know who turns out the light. But the Holy Spirit moves in, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. We're talking inheritance here. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If our daddy is the king, our inheritance is his kingdom. And that is clear from the time Jesus opens his mouth till he gives his life on the cross, till he goes back to heaven through the book of Revelation. That is our promise. Co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Now, I don't want to skip over that uh, if we share in his sufferings part. We've talked a lot about suffering and pain in the Grass is Greener series that we did several months ago. If, if you did remember that, we talked about suffering and pain and God's purpose for all of that. It, there's a good chunk on it there in chapter 8, but here's what it could be the summary, the Cliff's Notes version, is that here's the deal. When we live for Jesus, we are never promised it's going to be easy. There are lies spread by Christian teachers that when you become a Christian, everything gets better all the time. Your bank account's going to be full. You're going to drive the nicest car. You're going to have the prettiest wife, the most handsome uh, husband, the most obedient children. And everything's going to work out. And I'm going to tell you, uh, that's not been my experience, and that's not what Jesus said, and that's not what Paul said, and so I'm not sure where that's coming from. Yes, there are blessings, but sometimes the blessings are on the other side of the pain. The deal is, we don't have to go through the suffering alone. The Holy Spirit's there along with us the whole time. If you look there in verse 26, I love this. I don't have it on the screen, but it just says that when we don't even know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit will intercede for us. He'll pray with words too deep for us to even hear. He'll step in in our time of weakness. And if you've ever had that moment where you're like, just, oh, dear God, ah, the Holy Spirit's like, okay, I'll translate that. Uh, yeah, what they're saying is, <laughs> that's the translation that happens. The Holy Spirit's with us through the suffering, through the pain, through the hard times. Our Father is the creator of the universe. And our daddy don't mess around. He doesn't leave us alone. He moves into our life and helps to 
modify our character. Teach us love. Help us find holiness. And all the while, he's covered us in a blanket of his righteousness, which brings him joy. As we close out today, what I want to do is just read the last nine verses in chapter 8, starting at verse 31. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible, maybe the greatest passage in the whole Bible. I don't know. It's really good. But, but listen to this. After you've heard everything that you've heard, he says in verse 31, What then shall we say in response to these things? <laughs> That's a good question. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, how, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? <laughs> no one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Who's in charge here? Who is governing your mind? The flesh is needy, and it lets me down every time. It's the squeaky wheel in my life that... It begs for my attention, but the flesh cannot be our master because it leads to a slavery that none of us want to sign up for. But God is for us, and he's given his spirit in our lives to govern our minds, to guide us, to lead us, to help us, to change us, that we might be made righteous, that we would be the children of God. Who's in charge? Let's walk in the Spirit.